So, good morning, everybody. I'm very glad that so many people came today. It's my pleasure to introduce Ivan Janssens from University Antwerp. Actually, we met yesterday for the first time. I have worked with Ivan for several years, but we never met in uh, several publications. And Ivan and his group has been interested in the ICP forest uh, data set and LVF, the, the Swiss LVF is a part of this network. Ivan is professor at the University Antwerp since 2003 in the plant and vegetation ecology research group. And he's the chair of one of the nine center of excellence. And the name of this center is the Center on Global Change Ecology. Ivan is the leading expert in ecosystem functioning and conduct research on the effect of global climate change on ecosystems. Um, his research activities are focused on soil processes, on productivity of ecosystem, and on the importance of nutrients. Um, he is the, the author of uh, very uh, many uh, articles in the best scientific journals. Um, he is uh, active in many projects, very fascinating projects, and I will mention three of them because they are very interesting for us as well. This is the, the first one is the project Imbalance P, P for phosphorus. This is one of the few synergy grant funded by ERC. And the, the, this, this project investigates the effect of phosphorus, phosphorus limitations on natural and agricultural systems worldwide, with a strong focus on the tropics. And this is a joint uh, research program with three other principal investi investigators uh, for, for instance, Josep Penuelas in Barcelona, Philippe Sier in Paris, in Paris, and Michael Obersteiner from Wien, from Vienna. A second project is for hot, and uh, this is about the measurement of soil temperature along gradients in Iceland, and to see the, the effect um, how changes in soil temperature affect various ecosystem processes in both natural and grasslands, in both natural grasslands, sorry, and in the planted spruce forest. And a third project I would like to mention, you know it, it's ICOS, where greenhouse gases between the uh, terrestrial ecosystem and the atmosphere are measured. So in addition to these multiple interests, Ivan also has hobbies, and one of his hobbies is phenology. And this is the topic of your talk today, and we are very pleased to welcome you to, the, to this distinguished lecture, and we are looking forward to listening to you to your talk. Thank you very much. I think I'm going to need some help with this one. This one. Yeah, okay. So thank you, Elizabeth. So as Elizabeth introduced, so um, I've never really considered plant phenology as something I, I was supposed to be working on. It really started as a hobby. Uh, the place where I used to live in my street, it was full of linden trees and they all varied every year. They differed. Okay. Is it switch off? Or perhaps we can put the microphone closer to your mouth? Is this better? Okay, sorry. So it's always fascin fascinated me the um the leaf phenology. But I I have a background in soil processes and then from soil processes going to plant productivity and uh, I never really worked on this. Oh, sorry, I started too fast. Um, and then at a certain moment, I had 
two PhD students that just started on, on a project looking at root surface area with a new technology and turned out that the technology was flawed. So there I was with two students without a, a research topic. And because I was always so interested in, in phenology, I said, let's do something on phenology. So then we started studying phenology about, I think, seven, eight years ago. Okay. So before I start, I'd like to start thanking some people. So first, uh, Elizabeth and Ivano for their hospitality, the invitation and the hospitality. I had very nice discussions yesterday. Um, and I really appreciate it. And I also like to thank all the collaborators on everything I will be showing because uh, we had, have been using data from, from many different people. And then also all the people who are collecting all the phenology observations in the field and that share their data in this uh, European database from which I will be using a lot of, of data. And then last, I have to thank my wife for always supporting me and allowing me to come here. <laughs> Leaving on a Sunday. OK, so phenology is really fascinating. You know? it's, it, it really, everybody's interested in why is it earlier this year, why is it later in, in autumn that year. And um, it's not only fascinating, it's also really relevant. Phenology is very important for carbon uptake by ecosystems. So I just took two random examples. Oh, okay. What's this? Yeah, sorry. Two random examples. One of the first ones is from... Yeah, it went... When I tried it before, it went better, but I think it has to warm up a little bit. <laughs> okay, so the, one of the first ones was from Dennis Baldocchi, and uh, he related the, uh, the annual uptake of CO2, which is the NEE here, um, to the length of the growing season. And for all the uh, temperate to warm temperate and boreal forest is really... Uh, related nicely, the, the tropical forest, and in those days there was only one tropical forest, uh, was like an outlier. But also the interannual variation in CO2 uptake depends on, on phenology, and it's even been suggested that phenology in the Tibetan plateau affects the, uh, the um, energy balance and, and thereby affects the, the strength and the, the timing of the monsoon in, in Asia. So it's really relevant, so it's, it's worth studying. So one of the first things we did when, when we started, we had like also a Belgian phenology network. And so we uh, were asked to, to analyze those data. So the PhD students started um, testing all various models. Uh, so this, I'm not going to explain which models they are, but many different models with different assumptions. Okay, so this is really slow and then we have data for four species and basically the take-home message is that we can't really do a decent job you know you have the the mean is oh, is okay because of course we fit the model to the data but the root mean square and error here is, is 10 days or more this is this is basically something to be ashamed about and so we've worked and now we have a are using the European database, many more observations. And this is with four different models. And again, the mean. So what you see here is observed but burst dates on the, the x-axis and simulated ones on the y-axis. This is for the data we use to train the models and, and validation data. And, and the color is the number of observations. So yellow is many observations. So you see overall, it's we we're doing well. So the yellow is on the one-to-one -one line, but, it, but still the uncertainty is it's, it's so bad, it's to be ashamed about. So this is five years down the line, and we still haven't improved the models the way we wanted to. But I'll come back to this one, one later. So my presentation will, I will try to give an overview of what we know and then, then 
maybe end with uh, how we can make progress, or at least how I'm going to try to make progress. But I will end with soil carbon. Um, okay, and I've been told that I shouldn't go too far to the side so that the people in Davos can see me. So, uh, What do we know? Um, what we have known for centuries is that plants need warm temperatures in spring. Uh, so spring growth relates very strongly to spring temperature and for this, the growing degree day concept was, was developed. So for those of you who don't know it, so you have like a threshold temperature after a certain starting date. And if the, the day temperature is above the threshold, you take that difference above the threshold and you keep it. And the next day, if you're again above the threshold, you keep that temperature and you accumulate. And so then when a certain, so every day you accumulate growing degree days, and when you reach the required growing degree days, then bud burst is initiated. This is called the GDD model, growing degree day model, or the thermal time model. And, and when we analyzed our Belgian phenology data set, the thermal time model was the best model that we had, suggesting that probably spring temperature is the only thing that mattered. Now, we also know that Many plants, most plants from, from our regions, they also require chilling. So this means they depend on cold temperatures so that they realize when that winter is coming. And then they have to accumulate enough chilling to um, initiate um, uh, spring phenology. And what we know is that if the chilling requirement is not fulfilled or not completely fulfilled, then plants require more warmth in spring. So the growing degree days that are needed, they increase if, if less chilling um, um, has occurred. And this was elegantly shown, uh, amongst others, by, uh, by Jan Vitas, who is here somewhere. Oh, hi. Um, there's other studies that have shown it. Um, and so, Oops, no, I pressed the wrong button again, sorry. So it's clear that if, as, as temperature warms and the chilling uh, accumulation goes down at a certain moment, the, the chilling requirement is not fulfilled. And when this happens, the forcing requirement, so the requirement for warm temperatures in spring, increases. All right, so that's known. What is also known is that as it gets warmer, uh, and at the moment, bud burst advances, that this advance, advance of, of spring phenology cannot go on forever. That's logical. So in an experiment we did in, at Antwerp, we uh, exposed three species, well, saplings, like about one meter tall saplings, uh, to different temperature regimes over winter. So we had like ambient and then up to plus six degrees Celsius. And we did this in two consecutive years. The first year we had a cold winter, and the second winter we had a warm winter. And the warm winter, even without the heating, resulted in much earlier bud burst. So for birch, we only did it in the cold winter. Um, but what we see with the warming is that leaf unfolding dates advances, so it goes down. That's logical. But in the cold year, the first uh, year, 2010, temperature had a much stronger effect on the spring phenology than in the warm year. So it's not really that surprising because in the warm year there was less chilling, so the plants required more forcing. So it became less sensitive. And if we now express these changes, not relative to, to ambient, but relative to each other, we see that, and if we only look here, for beach, for example, the temperature sensitivity has gone, has increased, has become positive. So this is basically, the y-axis here is temperature sensitivity. The x-axis is the change in temperature relative to the previous temperature. So you see as it gets warmer, so as it gets warmer, this is comparing plus one degree with zero warming, plus two degrees with one degree warming. So as we go to very warm conditions, we have, we get positive temperature sensitivities. But we only had it in the warm year. We didn't have it in the cold year. 
So there's a clear interaction between cold temperatures and um, the requirement for um, warmth in spring and the temperature sensitivity. Okay, now the problem that we have is that we observe phenology and we only have an observation one date. So, or we could look at when does it start swelling and then a few, later, late, a few days or two weeks later, when does the bud open. But we only know what happens when we see something changing. But we know the, the chilling and the forcing, it's accumulating over the entire dormant season. So if we really want to have a better model, we should have measurements on the states of, of the dormancy, of the endodormancy, the echo uh, dormancy. And there's a very nice paper that uh, came out earlier this year by Isabel Schwein. And so what she did, so she had um, uh, three different species. And um, she took them in at, at uh, different times, uh, different degrees of chilling, and then exposed them to certain temperatures. And what she saw that there was a clear effect um, on the model performance if she knew what date chilling was fully accomplished. So she took cuttings, put, put them in the leaf, then exposed them to ideal growing conditions to initiate the, um, the flushing. And when this happened really fast, she said, OK, chilling has been fully um, accomplished. And so the knowledge of the end of the, full, of the, um, of the chilling um, period, putting this in the model, really improved the models. So we can improve the models by really focusing on, on endodormancy or, or the state of the, um, of the chilling requirement. Now, because we don't know, so there's one study by Isabel Schwinn on, on this, because we don't really know what's happening during the dormant season, we don't know when chilling and forcing temperatures start to accumulate. We guess, you know, we can put it for the chilling, we put it November 1st or September 1st or August 1st or the day that the buds were set. We don't really know. We also don't know how they respond to temperature. We, we have different assumptions, and then with, with fancy Bayesian parameterization techniques, you can say, okay, let's optimize for our data sets the temperature response function, but it could be whatever. And then we also don't know how they integrate, uh, how they interact, how chilling and forcing, how they're interacting, whether the forcing period, the, um, when, they dip, when the um, phenology depend on, on the spring warming, um, whether this already starts during uh, chilling or only afterwards. There are different opinions and as a result, we currently, we can develop a hundred different models and they will all do more or less equally good with the data on the current conditions because we use the data to, to train them. But they strongly diverge when we extrapolate to a future climate. So this is a study that's ongoing um, by a PhD student, and, and I've already shown you this, this graph. So uh, we have four models, and the thermal time model here is not doing as good. So the thermal time model is the model that ignores any chilling uh, effect. So it's not really doing that good, but the other models that either have different assumptions on, on how chilling and forcing interact, they all do equally good. And, but then when we extrapolate to a future climate, they start diverging. And for example, under the, um, the uh, 8.5 RCP from the IPCC, uh, this is Quercus robur and, and Quercus petrea. There's like a 13 day difference in the mean bud burst date that's projected. For Fraxinus, it's 10 days difference. Um, for Fagus, six day difference. So we don't know which model is the best. We don't even know whether any of them is, is okay. But that's the state where we are. We can reproduce the current observations, the mean okay, but with an, an uncertainty of 10 days. And if we really have like fewer observations, we can train the, better, the model even better. But at a larger scale, we're we're stuck. Okay, so we know 
plants require chilling and forcing. We know that there's an interaction between the, the forcing and the, the chilling. And we also know that many plants depend on uh, photoperiod in the control of their uh, phenology. This is a, a graph from another nice experiment done, done uh, here, nearby, um, where cuttings from, from trees in the field from different locations were taken to the lab and then exposed uh, to short photoperiod and, and long photoperiod. And what you see on the y-axis in each panel is the growing degree days that were needed to initiate the, the bud burst. So for some of the species, 5 out of 15, actually with longer days, less uh, forcing, less growing degree days were needed to initiate. But that's only 5 out of 14 species. And that's... A an issue, but the good thing was that these five, they're all late successional. So we could like come up with some kind of, of trait to extrapolate this. And the other good thing is that, well, for in Europe, it's the dominant species. Scots pine is not in this list, but there's like um, Norway spruce, uh, beech, uh, sessile oak. So these are very important species in, in Europe. Um, Okay, so we know that in addition to chilling, photoperiod plays a role, but only in, in certain species. And then Jan made a, a nice review on how photoperiod could be affecting uh, spring phenology. There's um, um, two different um, mechanism, mechanisms. One, oh, sorry, wrong button again. One is that the uh, photoperiod, there would be a threshold, so as it gets, so the y-axis is just the state of chilling. So more chilling to the right, less chilling to the left, and at a certain moment, the chilling requirement is not complete. So if you have more force, more warm weather, you will go to the left. And then it's possible, if, it, if it's warmer, you go to the left, that at a certain moment it gets too early and plants say, no, this is too early for me. So that uh, there's a photoperiod limitation that says it's not possible. And then when you do the calculations, it looks like GDD goes, goes uh, very high. Um, I haven't seen data on this, but probably, uh, theoretically, it's possible. And if I were a plant, I would probably use a mechanism like that. And then the other one is where um, the effect of photoperiod is by altering the increase of GDD as chilling goes down. So as if you have longer days, this line would be flatter. So longer days means lower requirement of forcing of GDD in spring, and then shorter days, a higher requirement of, of warm temperatures. And last winter, we did an experiment in Antwerp with two species where we again exposed one meter tall uh, saplings to different temperatures. And if we then make the same plot, so it's chilling accumulating, Accumulation and, and this is the growing degree days, but then we calculated it, we calculated growing degree hours. And in chestnut, and then we had two different treatments. So they have the same temperatures, so they have the same chilling, more or less the same forcing. Uh, but then we had half that would, had uh, short days and half with long days. And we see in, in chestnut, there's zero effect. So clearly the chestnuts were not. Uh, sensitive to, to day length, but the beaches were, but only when they were warmed strongly. So um, these, sorry, to the right, these are the unwarmed conditions, a little bit warming. Because, and then you see as, it, as warming continues, you go to the left. And then you also see the divergence in the required growing degree days or growing degree hours among the, uh, the treatments. And it's basically confirming this mechanism that, that Jan um, um, wrote about it several years earlier. And then last month, there's another interesting paper that was published in Nature Climate Change. So it's a, a group, a German group, and they collected uh, saplings, no, twigs from 104 tree species growing in their botanical garden. They took them to the lab, and then they exposed them to different uh, day length, to, and then see how long it took for um, bud burst to occur. 
And then some species, the majority of the species, didn't respond at all. So the, the photo period did not affect spring phenology. So that's uh, from the 144, 103 species. Well, there is an issue in this paper because if you sum this, you get to 154 species. But they only used 144, so I don't know where they, they made the mistake of 10. But it's also not so relevant. Um, the majority of the species does not respond to day length. There are some that respond very strongly. And then there were a bit more that were like intermediate. They did respond to day length, but not very, very strongly. And what you see here is that the interannual variation of the requirement for, uh, for forcing for warm temperatures in, in spring is, is greater when photoperiod starts to play a role. So this could also be relevant for further future modeling. Um, but even more important for, for modeling is that when they looked at the origin, the climate in, in the region of origin of the trees that were growing in their botanical garden, they saw a clear difference between cold regions, which are here on the right. So here on the x-axis, you see the number of months with a mean temperature less than 5 degrees Celsius. So the cold regions, they had uh, fewer species, actually here, zero, where for the period had a strong impact on spring phenology. They had some where it had an intermediate impact, and the majority, 70% um, of the species, was not impacted by photo period. Whereas if you go to warmer regions, say with um, uh, only three months with a mean temperature below five degrees Celsius, then they're like more equally distributed. So you have 30% or 25% of the species strongly photoperiod sensitive and the others um, almost the same. So what I didn't say, if you have questions, you can interrupt me. Eh? I'm used to teaching. I have students stopping me all the time. OK. So we already know quite a bit. We know photo now that photoperiod plays a role for some species and that there's like a latitudinal difference in, in the importance of photoperiod, or probably because I don't know what the effect could have been of taking plants from their country of origin, putting them in a botanical garden, and waiting a couple of years and then seeing what happens. Now, is this knowledge going to suffice to improve the models to, to a degree that their uncertainty becomes reasonable? Well, very likely it will, at least to a certain degree. At, at least if we know over the dormant season the, the state of the endodormancy and the state of the ecodormancy, we can really train the models much, much better. So I'm convinced that's going to make a strong um, difference. But it's possible also that there are other drivers. And that's basically what my presentation will be about. It's going to be about a number of recent observations related to, to spring phenology. And um, that may be important or maybe not. Uh, some I don't understand. I don't. We see a relation, but I don't know what the mechanism could be. But so let's let's have a look. So the first one was published uh, last year, I think, uh, and it shows that the, the warming sensitivity of uh, most deciduous uh, species in Europe is declining over time. So on the the right axis, this is this is time, but it's basically the temperature sensitivity on the y-axis, and just estimated by linear regression. So you plot uh, bud burst date versus temperature. For 15 years, you have a regression, and then you have a certain um, uh, slope. And this slope is the y-axis. And so we start here taking 15 years, starting in 1980 to 1994. And then we shift by one year, another year. And then at the end, we have the 15-year period starting in 1999. And if you do this for almost all species, we see this clear decline. And on average, we start with a sensitivity of four degrees, uh, sorry, four days advance per degree warming. And at the end, we're below three degrees 
so three days warming, per degree warming. Um, that's for species, seven species over time. If we do it differently, if we take, this is from the uh, European Phenology Database, if we put everything together, and we, for each uh, tree, we look at the sensitivity in two periods, the sensitivity from 1980 to 94, which is the red um, histogram here, or for all the trees, we look at the temperature sensitivity for uh, 1999 to 2013, we see that there's a clear shift to the left. So it's not only in these seven species, it's basically in the entire database, the uh, deciduous trees are becoming less sensitive to warming. And it's very likely that this is due to reduced chilling and therefore that the requirement for growing degree days has gone up. Um, in all these species, we see that chilling has gone down statistically significantly. And when we um, try to reproduce this with models, we reproduce it fairly well. So we think this is not an issue, this is understood. It's chilling that's causing this decline of temperature sensitivity. Um, another observation is that the, the response to temperature of, of uh, spring phenology is also related to the temperature variability. This is from a paper three years ago, two years ago. And what this, this shows, this graph, is the y-axis is just different species. So 45 species. And the colors, these are regressions, no, sorry, correlations. So this is correlations calculated by simple regressions, and this is partial correlations. Partial correlations, you try to remove uh, the influence of other potentially influencing uh, factors. So what we see in the second column, which is, which is leaf unfolding, we see almost everywhere pink to red. Also here, almost everywhere it's pink to red, and this suggests that where you have more, where spring temperatures are more variable, there you have a higher temperature uh, sensitivity. Now, I haven't tested the models if we can try to reproduce it. I, I don't think they will be able to, to reproduce this, but I'm not sure, but I'm almost sure they won't in the current versions. But I think if we can introduce photoperiod effects, then they might, because um, with um, photoperiod you will have more control. Um, so I think then, well, a back of the envelope calculation suggests that it could, and then if we can reproduce this with the models, then it means it's no longer a problem. Okay, a third observation is that if you relate, if you relate the, um, spring phenology to day temperatures, it's, um, it's no, sorry, so the, the spring phenology relates much more to the day temperature than to the night temperatures. Um, this is also from an experiment we did last winter. So this was an experiment I'm, 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 I was really uh, excited about. So we had four, four treatments. So we were growing three, one meter tall tree uh, saplings for treatments. We had the control, which is, yeah, it's difficult. This is the green line and it's the bottom one. It's always the lowest. So it's the lowest here, lowest here, lowest here. And then we had three warming treatments. We had warming where we warmed continuously by about two degrees Celsius. And that's the blue line. So the blue line and the bottom line is almost always has a two degrees Celsius difference. And then we had two other treatments. And in, in, in those, we try to have the same forcing, the same growing degree days, but in one um, treatment only by heating during the day and the other one only by heating during the night. So the black line here, this is the day, the day warming. So at night, this is three days. So at night, no warming, so the temperature is the same as the control. Then the day starts, so we heat by by a lot, by four degrees, because we had to, otherwise the average would be different. And then at night, we reduce this and we go back to the control. And the red line is the opposite. So we warm at night, then we go back to the control, and then we warm during the day. And by doing this, we were able, 
for these four treatments to have more or less the same growing degree days between, I think it was January 1st, and the date of bud burst. And also, we had in two treatments more or less the same chilling. When we started with this experiment, we didn't realize this, but we were constantly, while we were doing the experiment, keeping track of the growing degree days of the chilling. And then we noticed that those two treatments were very similar. And then every week, we optimized the warming so that we could have the two uh, similar chilling. So the black, the nighttime only, and the whole day warming, they have the same GDD and the same chilling. Nice. So which treatment do you think had the, the earliest bud burst? So now I'm waking you up. Okay, if you stay quiet, I'm going to nominate a victim. <laughs> and it'll be Jan. <laughs> Nobody? The daytime warming only, yeah. That's the earliest. It, it had the, the same GDD. It had higher chilling. It's something that's very counterintuitive. But it came earlier. Uh, which one was last? It's easier. It's the control because it had so control had much less uh, forcing that was last, but then we had two treatments, and if we would understand everything perfectly, they should have bud burst on the same date, and they didn't. So there was a clear difference. So the ones with the night warming, the black ones, had. Uh, leaf unfolding several days later than the ones with the gradual warming. So this just points out that there's something going on that we don't understand. I don't understand, at least. All right. Then we, this was one experiment. Is this something that could be more widespread? And yes. So looking at satellite observations of, of, uh, of greening in in spring. So here the nomenclature is a little bit different. So VGD is, uh, whoa. Okay, maybe I'm too far. Yeah, ah, okay. So the trick is to stay here and then it works well. But then I don't, oh, okay, okay, cool. Sorry. I've never used this thing, it's fantastic. Um, so VGD is vegetation green up day, and T max is basically the same as, as day temperature, and T min is night temperature. And if you look at the partial correlation between them, we see that across the northern hemisphere, it's almost all is green, and green means a negative correlation, and that's logical, right? So warmer means earlier bud burst, so that's a negative correlation. And then if you relate it to the partial correlation with the minimum temperature, the night temperature, well, there's almost the same are pixels that have a negative correlation than a positive correlation. So it's clearly the maximum temperatures that dominate. And very likely, I haven't tested it, but I'm almost sure that the models will be able, the current models will be able to, to capture this, this variation. But it's not everywhere. For example, in Tibet, we see that the night temperatures are much more important. This is basically the same as before, but now zooming in on, on, on Tibet. And Tibet is extremely cold in winter, but also extremely dry in winter. So it's, it's uh, kind of like a, a summer wet um, uh, climate. And, and here, if you look at the, the graph on the left, so that's vegetation green update. So the partial correlation with minimum temperature. And we see that so this is the histogram of, of the correlation. Like There's like a clear bias to strong negative correlations, like you would expect. So warmer T-min, earlier bud burst. And we don't have this with T-max. It's the opposite of what I just showed you before. Um, with um, T-max, there's like the same number of pixels that have a positive correlation as a, a negative correlation. And I don't understand it. It's 
probably related to stress avoidance or something, um, for or ex trying to avoid extreme um, events. I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't think the models will be able to reproduce this behavior. So for phenology, after a long dry season, probably the current models won't won't work. All right, then rainfall. Rainfall is, um, again, something that may influence phenology, but I don't know how it could. But if you think about it, it does make sense in the long term. So does rainfall matter? These are uh, data, so it's coming from the um, observations in, um, in Tibet only. So Tibet is dry in over winter. And, and there we see a very strong control of precipitation, winter precipitation on spring phenology. Like the bottom graph here just relates the sensitivity of um, spring phenology to precipitation, winter precipitation. So it's clear that as it gets after very dry winters or in very dry regions, um, if it rains a bit more, uh, phenology will be earlier, but it, this is not in the wetter part or in the, uh, the wetter years. If you have a lot of rain, then more rain doesn't really lead to earlier bud burst. But look at the interaction with the temperature sensitivity. The drier parts or the drier years, you have very low temperature sensitivity. The two lines here, the, the gray line is for all the data and the black line is uh, only the, the ones where the relation with temperature was statistically significant. But you clearly see that as it gets wetter, temperature control starts to be stronger. Um, there's no moisture in any of the models, so for sure they won't be able to capture this. Now that's Tibet, where if you think about it, it's logical. Plants, they know that every winter it's dry and they shouldn't start growing even if it's warm, if the soil is still too dry. There it's logical. But what about wetter areas? So we did the same um, um, study using remote sensing based estimates. And what you see here, I have to make sure that, oh no, I have to stay here, sorry. What you see here is again partial correlations. And the, the top one is the correlation between the chilling requirements, so the growing degree days, and the accumulated chilling. And you see, um, and the you, it's only given where the correlations are statistically significant. So all the gray areas is where the relation was not statistically significant. And you see there's a dominance of blue, which means the negative correlation, and this is what we know. You know more, if, as, if you go with warming, you have less chilling, and less chilling means a higher GDD requirement. So this is also known, uh, seen in, in the satellite data. But this is partial correlation, so we correct for all the rest. But if we then look at the impact of precipitation, so it's the correl partial correlation with precipitation correcting for any influence of chilling and, and, and other factors, we clearly see a positive effect. So more precipitation implies a, a higher GDD. And I don't know why how this can be, but we see it. So less chilling, more GDD, we know this, but also more rain, more GDD. Um, so yes, rainfall matters, and probably models won't be, well, for sure models won't be able to capture this. Now, there's one thing I want to say here, maybe this is not true at all. Because in the modeling, we depend on air temperature, but the tree doesn't really care too much about air temperature. It, it needs the temperature of the bud that matters. And if there's less rain, it's very likely that there's more radiation. And radiation warms up the bud more than it warms up the air, so that the real GDD that the bud is seeing is much greater than what we are modeling with, with the uh, air temperature observations. So maybe this is all an artifact. Um, or maybe not. So, but we have this European phenology database, 
So we're doing experiments on, on this, but we haven't succeeded. I know Jan is doing experiments on this, so I hope he can inform me later. But we did the same analysis, not on the remote sensing data, but on the phenology database. And again, we look at partial correlation, but we're talking about thousands and thousands of trees now. So this is just histograms. Oh. And I have to stay here. These are just histograms. And the black, the black correlation here, or the black uh, histogram, this is for the correlation between the heat requirements, so the GDD, and the chilling. It's negative, we know this. So more chilling means um, uh, less heat requirements, a negative correlation. So that's clearly seen in the data. But then if we look at, precipit at radiation, so this is an, an error. This should be minus 0.18 because as you, it's clear there's a negative correlation. So there's a negative correlation with radiation, but when correcting for this, we still see a positive correlation with precipitation. So if you take into account the effect of chilling and you take into account the effect of radiation, there is still a, radi a, a precipitation impact on the GDD requirement. So Rainfall does matter. So far, it looks like it. Yeah, and I don't know um, what the mechanism could be, so I have no clue how we can include this in the models. The effect of the radiation that's probably feasible. So there will be surface temperatures we can use instead of air temperature, or maybe we can even uh, come up with like um, a, a small a small module to convert air temperature to uh, surface temperature based on radiation. So, so that impact is possible. The one for the precipitation, I have no clue. OK, the next observation. And OK, I'm running very late now. Five minutes, OK. OK, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, am I going to skip this? I'm going to not skip this. This is too nice. Uh, so there were reports that phenology it had been advancing and that from the remote sensing uh, world that phenology was delaying. But then if you look at the papers coming from the analysis of the, of the phenology database, so the, the actual monitoring of the trees, they said, no, no, it's still advancing. So if you look at, at the histogram of, of the two um, to data sources. So this is for the uh, for between 1982 and 1990, and this is the change of the spring phenology in days per year. So what you see in the earliest period, so the gray one here, that's the remote sensing um, observations, and only for pixels where we had trees in the database. You clearly see that it's it's negative. So the remote sensing was advancing very, very much, these pixels. Uh, this one was also negative, but with more spread. And then if you go to the 12 years after 2000, you see that the remote sensing, they tended to estimate a delay, whereas the database still said, no, no, it's still advancing. So this was like an apparent contradiction, and in fact, it's not really. Um, if you look at, oh, sorry, I first have to explain the, this, this schematic. So here we have the results from the monitor, from the database, so the phenology database, um, for two, the same two periods. And these are all different trees, and they're ranked um, according to the date that they're of bud burst. So the earliest species are here, the latest species are there. So in the first part of the time series, it's clear all the species were advancing. Sorry, the y-axis is the, uh, the change in, in days over the period. Um, and here, it's no longer the case, the second period. So the late species, they continue to advance. The middle species, they were still advancing, but less. And the early species, they had shifted. So these earlier species, in the last part of this analysis, had bud burst later than before. Now. If you look at the database, 
It's dominated by beech and oak and etc. So, and they're the later ones. So the histogram that I showed you of the from the from the field data, they're dominated by by late trees that continue to advance. But the remote sensing, we look at the start of the greening. The remote sensing, it sees the earliest plants. It sees the understory and it sees the shrubs and the earliest tree species. So it's not a surprise that they that they differ. In fact, they're both correct. It's just they're seeing something something different. And it's also not a surprise that these earlier plants um, had delayed budburst because during this, this period, this is the change. Oh, sorry. This is the change in the temperature of the months in the first study period. They all advanced, so also all the trees advanced. Sorry, they all became warmer, so all the trees advanced. Whereas in the second part of the study period, December, January, February, March, all became colder. So this means the trees that were um, unfolding their leaves in this period, well, they postponed it. Whereas the ones that had late uh, bud burst, April or, or May, they responded to the further, the continued increase in, uh, in temperature. All right, so there is no contradiction. You just have to know that they see something different. Okay, so I am going to not talk about legacy effects, I'm sorry. But I'm going to talk about Forhot, which is one of the um, projects I'm, I'm very strongly working in. So Forhot is um, located in Iceland. It's really cool. It's, um, it's grassland and they're on natural geothermal gradients. So you have because of all the uh, volcanic activity and you have faults in the, in the Earth's crust, you have areas where you have steam coming to the surface. And so it's faults, they're very hot, and then through conduction you, you have, and, and radiation, you have warming of, of, the, of the soil um, perpendicular to the, to the faults. It's really cool and so we try to measure everything that we know how to measure. Um, the sheep is, is nice, but we keep it out of our plots because we want to measure plant growth and the sheep are not helping with that. Um, and, and the warming is pretty consistent. So we've installed um, temperature sensors at different depths. And um, so you clearly see, well, we have plots. I have to say this. We have plots that, that are not warmed. We have them at plus one degree Celsius, plus three degrees, plus five, plus 10, up to plus 20. And um, so this is really cool. And this is a graph on the legacy. I have to uh, get rid of the legacy. And now this is not on photo period, but I'll try to come back to photo period later when, when ending my talk. So the first thing we measured was soil carbon stocks. And it's not surprising that they declined. So what you see here, this is the temperature increase relative to the ambient conditions. What you here see on the y-axis, this is the soil carbon stock. So it's being corrected for, for the compaction because you lose carbon, you see the bulk density increasing, so it's corrected for this. And you see a strong linear decline of soil carbon stocks um, with warming, about 4% per degree Celsius warming. And the cool thing there is we have one valley where the warming was initiated in 2008 after an earthquake, but the adjacent valley, the warming has been there for many centuries. It's already described in the sagas that that valley has these warming radiants. And it's already been measured and noted, but in official documents, but that's only like 50 years ago. But we see that both the short-term warming and the long-term warming, it doesn't matter, you lose the carbon. And the top uh, 10 centimeters, 4% per degree Celsius, and below that, almost 3%. And you would say, okay, this will release nutrients, and it does, so the plants will grow more, and they don't. If you look at plant biomass, above ground biomass, there's no relation with temperature, and below ground, actually there's also no relation with temperature up to, say, plus 10 degrees Celsius. And beyond that, you see the roots really crashing, but plants are not growing more, and still we see higher nitrogen availability in the soil, we see more 
emissions of, of nitrogen gases, etc. So that's very strange. So the nitrogen is mineralized and it's not retained and not used. If you look at the stoichiometry of, so the biomass stays the same, the stoichiometry of the biomass stays the same, the stoichiometry of the soil organic matter stays the same. So for all the carbon we lose, we lose the proportional amount of nitrogen. It's very, very weird. I don't fully understand it, but I think plant phenology plays a role here. Because this is Iceland, so for a long period this is dark, so the plants are forced to go in a dormant phase. Because the dark period is so long, they will stop exuding carbon because they have to be very conservative with their carbon. We've measured growth of bacteria and, and fungi, we've measured respiration by them. We can add nitrogen to them, we can add phosphorus to them, but they only increase their respiration and their growth if we add sugars. So you add sugars, so this means that the energy limited, these microbes, and because the plants during a long period are not providing energy to the microbes, I think the microbes can't grow, and if they can't grow, they cannot immobilize nitrogen over winter. But the entire winter, the enzymes, they stay active, so they keep on mineralizing, releasing um, soluble um, compounds, nitrogen compounds, and I think they're all just lost from the system. That's my hypothesis. So I think plant phenology also matters in the feedback in, in, in this system. And so I am going to steal one more minute. <laughs> I was going to stop there, but this was like my, my main conclusion. So thinking about what I, where I want to go to with my phenology-related work, it's basically the six observations that I showed you. And then I also really want to invest in, in understanding chilling and, and photoperiod. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, chilling and photoperiod impacts by doing measurements during the dormant phase. And I don't, I, th I think the, the only way forward is to do like metabolomics and transcriptomics on a mass scale starting in September. It's going to be very expensive. But I think if, if we do this, we can really make, make a difference. So I'd like to end with this statement. So, Ivan, many thanks for this comprehensive presentation. I was very impressed by what we are doing during your hobby. Yeah. And uh, um, I also learned that uh, there this reduced sensitivity of spring phenology to warming is new for me, so it, it's very interesting. And do you know more about, for instance, the, the change of color during the fall and the little fall? What does it imply for the vegetation, vegetation period? Um, no, but one of my colleagues just got an ERC starting grant to study this. So uh, I hope to say more in a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have questions in Biermannsdorf? Okay, let's start with Connie. Thanks, Jan. I enjoyed your talk. My question is, I was thinking about Tibet. Have you tried to look at the water vapor and the optical pass lengths of the atmosphere? Because I think it has a relation of the warming of your butts or this, the night and the day time, because it might be a good correlate to, to get relative humidity, absolute humidity and optical pass lengths as a predictor as well, because the atmosphere reacts very differently. And that means your leaves will uh, be affected differently. If there is more humidity, it transfers the energy. No, I haven't thought about that. Maybe I should spend a couple of weeks in Tibet and, uh, <laughs> as an excuse. So, other questions? Um, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I, I have a question about the... The number four, the rainfall pat matters. I mean, wh why is the rainfall? I mean, I, st I saw the your study area is in high latitude and it's winter. So, um, sh should yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Should what that be precipitation in, or snow snowfall in dry areas? Yeah, 
And I, and I I'm, I and when I look at your uh, the figure you you show um, about the relationship between the growing degree day and the uh, and the uh, rainfall, and I feel it makes makes sense to me. I maybe I can provide them. Um, some explanations. I mean, because uh, when, when you know when, when there's a higher um, snowfall or precipitation in the winter mm -hmm. in the high latitude, it will be causing higher soil temperature mm -hmm. that will thus affect the, the the phenology in the coming in the next year. So um, I I I went to Svalbard this year and. I, I I went to I went to the field and see um, there was a record there. They observed the soil temperature year by year, and they saw um, uh, when there's a very extreme uh, snowfall, uh, the soil temperature could be higher mm -hmm. uh, than the air temperature, and it could be even above zero. You know, this is so. I I I'm, I think maybe this is something. Could um, help could be helpful yeah. to explain the the pattern that why uh, the higher correlation between the rainfall and the precipitation in the winter and the growing degree in phenology. That's a very good yeah. suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have an idea how previous year? Uh, growth conditions could affect spring phenology. So in other words, how the carbon pool of previous years could could have an effect on, on what you have shown here. I, I think that's the part that I didn't show. I think it has a strong effect. Now I have an excuse to show the graphs. Uh, so this is in, in, in the grasslands. No, no, that's not the one I want to show. So this is on, on legacy where we, this was just by chance, so we had an experiment where we had all these different warming treatments, and so we selected the ones that were at plus six degrees and the ones that were not warmed. Um, and you see that, oh, sorry. Where am I? Yeah, so you see that the flushing is very strongly different. So we have two plants, plant tree groups with like a, a one month different in the start of the growing season. So then we, we measured, actually we wanted to look at what is the impact of the growth during that season. And then we measured um, at basically everything we could measure, all the, the growth and photosynthesis and the nutrient status and starch. And, and we didn't really see very strong impacts except on, on the senescence. So the senescence, when, the, when they started earlier, they also ended earlier. And very surprising to me, oops, yeah, this one, even the next year's phenology was, was affected. So there is, I think, a carryover. Probably the ones that started senescing sooner meant that all their reserves were, were full, and so they couldn't use the photosynthates anymore. And... Um, and they probably had a better carbohydrate status and therefore maybe took a risk. So we still have, even though the, all these plants were in a common garden, they were all watered and irrigated the same way, we still had like a legacy effect of the earlier burbers to first year through senescence on. So um, it, it happens. And, and we also see this in, um, in the phenology database. If you start looking focused, you clearly see that there are relations. So I, I will come, yes, I will go to Davos perhaps. Hi Davos. Do you have some questions? So <laughs> let's continue in BM and stop. Um, is there some practical implication of your research? So if I was a farmer or a forester, should I be worried about this shifting phenology? Or can you make the link to, to the impact of late to those frost who events, don't or? do modeling? No. No. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> it's, uh, it's my hobby. It stays with fascin fascination. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Andy? Did you also do some analysis on uh, leaf senescence? You just talked about the beginning of, of, of leaf unfolding. Yes. Is this also part of your hobby? Uh, well, it, it was becoming my hobby, but now my, my colleague got his ERC, so I'm going to give him some space and not interfere too much. Yeah, we, we have nice results on, on senescence, you know, just... So there's this relation between the start and, and the end of the season. It's very strong in grasslands. Like if in, in, in Iceland, if we, we look at uh, interannual variation, if, if, the, if the spring starts uh, earlier, they will, the grasses will senesce earlier and, and vice versa. We have this in, in trees. Um, we did, an, in the, as, from last winter, we had an experiment where I only showed like, the responses to the temperature, but we also had like, uh, pots that were well fertilized and pots that didn't receive fertilizer, and we see a, a very strong impact on, on senescence through there. So, yeah. And the impact of drought on leaf senescence? Do you have results on these two? No, that's the topic of the uh, ERC of my colleague. Yeah. So he's collaborating with WSL on, on uh, studying the impact of growth on, on senescence. What is the name of your colleague? Matteo Campioli. Ah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. In Davos, do you have a, a question? Second chance? <laughs> You're putting them under a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. last question here in Beerman stuff. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, in previous years, you have worked a lot on nitrogen deposition, and I was wondering like, if you could maybe regress a bit on how nutrient contents in soils or different soil textures could affect phenology. That's a, a vicious question. Uh, no, I know the nutrients, they play a role, and I don't know whether they, they probably play a role through carbohydrate status, but I cannot elaborate on them. It would be pure, not even speculation. So, so maybe give me a couple of beers in the afternoon, and then I will start addressing that question. Yeah, maybe in one of your projects. Uh, in YouTube. Yeah, Possibly. it's a good idea, yeah. But I think you're better situated here. Eh? You have the uh, ICP forest observations. So they, they study all the deposition and the nutrient status. So. Yeah. OK. So I would, like, I would like to thank you again for this very nice presentation. And I know that it was a sacrifice for you because today is Saint Nicholas, Sinterklaas, and it's very important in Belgium. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Sinterklaas is very happy about you, the soap. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So thanks a lot. <laughs>